of AI systems making decisions about who lives and dies completely changes the entire frameworks on which we base war. As AI redefines our world, AI, AI, artificial intelligence, a new type of warfare is emerging and we're seeing it take shape on the battlefields of Ukraine. With superpowers battling for AI supremacy, many experts fear we're hurtling towards an unstoppable arms race. The worst case scenario is that warfare is accelerated to a point where nobody can control what is going on. Is it too late to rein in the rise of artificial intelligence? Intelligence, I wanted to set the scene with these two videos that shows two different aspects of uh, artificial intelligence that are currently debated. The first one that you see, the beautiful one, has been uh, published at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. It's called Unsupervised. What is it? Uh, they've digitized the collection, at least part of the collection of the Museum of Modern Art, and then they deployed algorithm to produce art on top of the art that has been digitized. And uh, whoever has been there, it's quite fascinating, and uh, I let you judge if it's art or not art, because it's produced by artificial intelligence, but it's nevertheless beautiful. The second is, Another aspect of the deployment of artificial intelligence, you've, saw, you, you've seen two things in uh, this video, the second video. Uh, one is how you use artificial intelligence to plan the deployment of troops, notably using machine learning to see the patterns of your enemy and the patterns of your own troop. And the second element that you've seen at the end, where you have the swarm of drones, is how you can automate the deployment, because uh, you can easily imagine there are no control towers to manage a swarm of uh, drones. Uh, you, they are just autonomous, and they have peer-to-peer -peer, uh, relationship. And uh, that's the, 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 the context in which we evolve in artificial intelligence, as every time there is a breakthrough in technology, <laughs> there is this discussion about the utopian or dystopian perspective of technology. And the answer it will be about will it save or destroy the world, and the answer is neither nor. And uh, for a simple reason that technology, ultimately, it's a machine, and a machine produces tasks, and human beings are normally more than a collection of tasks. And uh, that's, that's the, why this debate always appear, but always come to the same conclusion. Uh, on a broader scale, this has been approached by uh, Professor Carlotta Perez. She's an economist, British Venezuelan, and she has uh, worked in extensively on the cycles in technology, and you see uh, patterns with the usual expansion and contraction. And it has started long time ago, more recently with the steam machine, up to the microprocessor, and what we are just seeing with artificial intelligence right now. Just to contextualize and say this is an important uh, breakthrough, no doubt about it, but no different, in my view, than the previous breakthrough we've seen in technology, and uh, we will have to uh, approach it uh, uh, in a meaningful way. To do this on the panel today, I'm very pleased to find old colleagues, <laughs> new colleagues, mm -hmm. uh, on the panel. I will start uh, with uh, Professor Daniel Handler. He's a member of the Academy des Sciences Morales et Politiques, and he has just published a book called Intelligence Artificielle, Intelligence Humaine, La Double uh, Enigme. Uh, I can only recommend, of course, the reading of this book in best libraries, including online, available. And uh, Daniel will set the context. I think artificial intelligence is complex. There are different types of artificial intelligence, and uh, Daniel will showcase this. Then we will move with uh, Professor Kazuko Suzuki. He is uh, at the University of Tokyo and director of the Institute of Geoeconomics uh, as well, and he will cover uh, the state of the policies regarding artificial intelligence. Then we are joined by uh, Associate Professor Amina uh, Al Sumaiti. Uh, she's uh, in the Electrical Engineering and Computer Science of the Khalifa University, and she will present us what she's working with the team about applying uh, artificial intelligence, notably 
in uh, transport system or smart cities, which is the focus of a, of a work. Then to make the connection with uh, topics we have discussed in technology before at the World Policy Conference, uh, Toby Simon, who is the founder of Synergia, a think tank and incubator based out of Bangalore, active in the Trilateral Commission, will cover the cybersecurity aspect of uh, AI. You have artificial intelligence for cybersecurity and the data protection, notably uh, in artificial intelligence. That's what he will cover. And lastly, I thought it would be of interest to think, oh, you are, we have artificial intelligence as we know it, or as you will discover it today, uh, but then there will be the two more charged artificial intelligence once we can uh, deploy quantum technology, and that's what uh, François Barrault, entrepreneur well known from the team here and the World Policy Conference, uh, chairman of the uh, DG World Institute and also a board member of Sandbox, uh, and he will tell us about his experience uh, in uh, quantum technology and how it will accelerate uh, even further the deployment of artificial intelligence. So, without further ado, Daniel, set the scene. Thank you, thank you, Patrick. I'm very happy to be here. So. Um, some people ask me how I could have written a 400-page book on AI when uh, the topic is so new, right? It's been around for a year or so. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, AI wasn't born with ChatGPT. Uh, and the basic idea in rudimentary form has been around for at least two centuries, if we go back to Charles Babbage and Lady Lovelace and even longer if we go back to Jacquard and Pascal, Hobbes, and Leibniz. In its modern form, AI was launched by Alan Turing in 1950 and was baptized in 1956, so it's about 70 years old. How can a little history help grasp the present situation? Well, first, it dispels the notion that present-day uh, present AI systems came out of the blue, the outcome of a revelation that overnight changed the fate of mankind. Rather, it's the result of a long and windy process during which it ran into limits and was forced to abandon its initial assumptions and undergo a radical thinking. Instead of uh, taking mental processes to be a kind of logic it started seeing them as a kind of perception. Instead of trying to uh, mimic the kind of thoughts that we entertain consciously, AI aimed for the sort of information that neurons can process, information to which we have no direct access. We don't know how we achieve uh, such feats as recognizing a mother's face, for example, or how I can produce uh, intelligible text that you seem to be able to understand. We just don't know how it happens. So instead of trying to directly turn to von Neumann architecture into a thinking machine, it chose to educate what's known as neural nets. <clears throat> now another reason for remembering the birth of AI is the name it chose for itself, which masked an ambiguity was it aiming for intelligence or something else? Do you put a hyphen between artificial and intelligence, or don't you? Um, from day one, there were two projects behind the project. One was to create a computational system that would think like humans, a thinking machine, and be intelligent in the sense where humans are intelligent. The other project was to find ways to automatize the solution to as many kinds of problems as possible, from chess to translation, from pattern recognition to robot navigation and what we've seen on the video. Um, on the face of it, these are two different things, two distinct goals, yet the basic insight was that thinking is nothing really more than the ability to solve problems. A fully intelligent system would be one that could solve all kinds of problems. And conversely, the more problems a system could 
uh, solve, the closer it would come to full intelligence. So AI set out to automatize one problem after the next. It turned out to be more difficult than expected. Uh, AI systems could not figure things out from scratch. They needed rich input, too rich to be spoon-fed by the human programmer. So they turned into neural nets net that could learn by themselves from examples. And after a slow start, neural nets met with smashing success. But here's the thing. The systems that AI built, whether old-style reasoners or new wave perceivers, were special purpose problem solvers, a population of specialized algorithms that did not add up to anything remotely resembling our human intelligence. So it seemed that one of the two goals that AI had set for itself at the beginning had been dropped. So the mainstream of the profession took that as a fact of life, and still does. There are enough problems or tasks waiting to be automatized or to be automatized more efficiently to keep AI engineers busy. But the dream of a machine that would be genuinely intelligent, a true thinking machine, one that would possess what's known as artificial general intelligence, or AGI, or again, human-level intelligence, is alive again. The advent of large language models and of generative AI has tipped the balance. The ability to, command, to compose on command coherent and often relevant text and images of any kind and on any topic is not only, as everyone was quick to realize, a true game changer in terms of applications in countless domains, it also makes it more plausible that AGI, artificial general intelligence, might be within reach in just a few years. But now I get to be a little bit controversial. It is based on this idea that AGI is around the corner, is based on two assumptions that are implausible. The first assumption is that the current victorious trend is bound to continue until the entire repertory of kinds of problems which the human mind can solve has been conquered by AI. The second assumption is that once that happens, human-level intelligence will have been reached. As for the first, least implausible assumption, there are two grounds for caution. First, the current spectacular systems are far from perfect and far from fully understood. There are too fragile a basis for predicting future success. The second problem is that even if the present successes do herald further progress, which I grant, they don't support the idea that problems of all kinds are within reach. In fact, it's pretty clear that those which are obey some severe constraints. As for the promise that human-level intelligence is within reach, that's my second assumption, which I think is implausible, I claim that it is, in fact, completely idle. I can only offer two arguments today, the time remaining. The first is that the most visible scientific leaders of AI today all agree on the need for some new insight, in the absence of which AI will plateau. AI today may in fact be on the eve of a turning point similar to the neural net revolution, but it doesn't know yet where to turn. And the second reason I can advance is the observation that human intelligence, as Patrick was actually saying in his introduction, is only very partly a matter of problem solving. And I can't see how AI as presently conceived can do anything but solve problems. These two assumptions are not only implausible, they're also potentially harmful. They send the profession on a wild goose chase that of artificial, fully autonomous thinkers, instead of sticking to what I take to be AI's major calling, which is to provide, uh, to provide humankind with powerful, trustworthy auxiliaries that can help us overcome some of the present technical, scientific, social, and political challenge, as well as facilitate daily tasks for which help is really needed. And these assumptions also facilitated a major falsification making 
Uh, mechanical systems pass off as silicon-based, genuine human beings. The irony is that some people worry about the so-called existential risk posed by human-level, and in short order, by superhuman-level intelligence. As I see it, the worry is misplaced. What does worry me, though, is the combination of the unfounded belief that AGI is around the corner with a misplaced priority given to the goal of having AI implanted as in many contexts as possible for the sake of making use of such a wonderful tool, regardless of the broader consequences. In my view, the central challenge today is to turn AI into a regular engineering discipline, one which produces, in a well-understood fashion, trustworthy artifacts with built-in guardrails against improper use. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, so, <clears throat> uh, trying to summarize, but uh, so what I understand, and we agree on the panel, <clears throat> today what we see is specific AI. We don't see the path to general AI, which remains a possibility, but not today. Uh, so why do we talk so much about artificial intelligence? Is because, what, as you described, there is this breakthrough. Uh, before, we could input, have input in artificial intelligence that became simple and complex, but the output was always simple. And in fact, with ChatGPT, we have complex output. What is a complex input and output is that you can take uh, text, images, videos, sounds, and you can produce the same, which we couldn't do before. So that's the breakthrough. Uh, it has impact. It has impact not only when you play with your kids, but uh, it has impact in the enterprise. And as we heard on the panel with Virginie Robert yesterday, uh, it can interfere in the democratic processes. So it requires policies uh, to accompany this development. And uh, Kazuto, I'll let you give us the landscape of where we are in policies. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Patrick. I think uh, that's a very nice segue to, uh, to my discussion about uh, the policies and the governance of the AI. I think um, this uh, 2023 is the sort of a turning point of the uh, uh, AI regulation. For many years, the AI was uh, in the, you know, shown in the first video <coughs> that um, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a creation as well as it's a, uh, it's a risk for using for the military purposes. <coughs> So there's been a long discussion about the laws, the lethal autonomous weapon systems in the United Nations and uh, particularly under the context of the uh, Covenant of the Conventional Weapons, CCW. And uh, there were not much progress in uh, regulation because on the one hand, there are big countries like United States and China, Russia, try to use the AI for improving their military capabilities, while there are certain concerns that these AI will go beyond the uh, human control. So the, the hot point or the, the talking points all the way is that um, how human can control the AI. The problem is, as Daniel has uh, described, uh, is changing because the context is, uh, is now not only uh, AI is used for the military purposes, but also the political purposes. The uh, election interference uh, we discussed uh, uh, yesterday, and also there are a number of occasions that there are fake news, uh, the fake video, and you know the the progress of uh, ChatGPT and uh, uh, large uh, large scale langu language model has made it possible to create the uh, animations and, uh, and the videos that is quite difficult to distinguish with the real ones. So there are uh, discussions going on from uh, uh, starting from the uh, uh, May uh, G7 Hiroshima summit and there was a, a, a discussion about the, to start the AI Hiroshima process and uh, in June the EU has uh, uh, set up the AI Act uh, which is to focus on the safe use of AI and the protection of and respect of the fundamental rights and values. And also in July, there was a, a Security Council discussion about the uh, uh, AI meeting, which is the first time that the Security Council takes, takes out the AI as the one of the threat to the international security led by UK 
and the Antio Antonio Guterres, um, uh, the uh, Secretary General of the United Nations, has has proposed the idea to set up the uh, international institution for inspection of the uh, uh, inspection and verifying the AI products, and uh, that may. Well, we are still in the discussion how, what kind of uh, uh, system or the international institutions can monitor and, and verify those uh, AI-generated uh, information, but uh, I think it is still a very much uh, in, in, uh, in uh, infant uh, stage. And then in September, there was a, a G7 guidelines for designing AI, so the, all the AI designers uh, should be monitored and reporting to the authorities to control the, uh, to, to set the certain guidelines or guardrails to, uh, to make sure that it doesn't go beyond the certain unexpected use of AI. And then October, the last month, there were a lot of initiatives took place there are internet governance forum in Kyoto to discuss uh, under the UN flag to uh, to regulate the uh, to regulate the uh, uh, AI uh, AI use and also the uh, until recently there was a, a UK uh, AI safety summit uh, where you know everyone's talking about the Elon Musk and the Rishi Sunak talking about it but uh, there aren't much uh, have come out it was basically. Uh, uh, pointing out some of the uh, issues for the necessity of international collaborations, uh, taking appropriate measures, uh, you know, uh, finding out uh, the risks and the uh, area of cooperation. So that was very general um, outset of the uh, AI regulation. And I think the most powerful and, uh, uh, and a detailed uh, discussion or detailed uh, um, uh, regulation has set out by the United States. The, uh, the President Biden has issued an executive order, uh, which is to uh, to set up the new standard for the uh, for companies to 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 uh, to follow the, uh, the to design uh, uh, to design the the AI and also providing the test result to the authorities. Uh, protection of the consumers and uh, uh, try prevent the the use of AI for uh, which may uh, involve some of the discriminatory uh, 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 algorithms and also focusing on the medical AI and also talking about the international partnership and I think this is an uh, interesting development because there are so much focuses on the use of AI not for the so for the military purposes, but also the civilian use, and also the danger for using AI for the um, you know uh, life-threatening situations like a medical uh, situation or the transport or uh, you know uh, all these uh, <coughs> things that are related to the the safety and the security issues. So I think the. Uh, the discussion of the, uh, to control and regulate the AI is now just beginning, but it is more or less focused on the, uh, within the G7 or uh, Security Council level, and uh, it is not expanding to the wider scale. And what is interesting is that uh, uh, last month when the, there was a, a Belt and Road uh, Initiative Summit uh, took place in Beijing, China also uh, launched the, something called uh, Global AI Initiative, which is in the context of the other three uh, initiatives, Global Development Initiative, Global Security Initiative, and Global Civilization Initiative. So the China is showing its interest to, to, to get along with this uh, 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 global AI governance, but uh, there were not much uh, details um, uh, uh, published uh, from the from the China side. So, we'll s perhaps this is a sort of a, 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 a sort of a harbinger of the further uh, confrontation of the G7 AI uh, regulation and also the Chinese. Uh, uh, regulation which is based on the different values uh, from the G7. And finally, our, I, I think there are a there are number of issues that is involved, uh, but I think 
there are much less attention paid to the military use of AI. And I think this is one of the problems because, because the use of AI is so wide, uh, there are the shift of the focus uh, turns around uh, every time that we discuss. So I think the, when we talk about the, um, the AI regulation, we need to set the sort of a sectoral regulatory framework for the military use, the uh, prevention of the interference, uh, election interference, uh, prevention of the uh, production of AI, AI for the fake news, and so on and so forth. So I think this segmentation of the AI regulation is necessary, but now it is still a very broad, uh, broad discussion, and I think uh, we need to elaborate that. And I think this discussion today will start will be the starting point of this uh, uh, this sort of a new regulations. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Kazuto. Uh, yeah, uh, it, it illustrates again, as uh, Daniel was saying, while well, the beginning of the debate, we discover it and say, what do we do with it? Uh, that's the beginning. What I observe in complement of what you said is that when you look uh, I I the different part of the world, Europe is still on the defensive, yeah. the usual. So what they did, they, as we can't, unfortunately, create the tech champion well, the first to regulate to prevent the other to act, so it's rather defensive. <laughs> uh, the US is dominating, so they uh, regulate to make sure they maintain the domination. And with a balancing act, though, with the election and the left part, as you mentioned, of the, of the Democratic Party. And China is discreet, but uh, just uh, uh, they are the leader in computer vision, for instance, and uh, they have very powerful program uh, in not only assessing human behavior through uh, artificial intelligence, but predict human behavior. And behind it, there is notably a company called Biden's, and mm -hmm. this is a company who owns TikTok. So I let you make the connection. I won't go any further. But uh, we see the same pattern, but this is a very complex topic. Yeah. And we really need to have, I think, everyone to realize oh, that's where it is. And as you rightly said, there are different aspects to it that will require different type of treatment. So thank you. So now moving to more the applied part. So, Amina, where do you see the opportunities? We, ha we have the slides on in front of us, but not behind us. Here, you have it. Imagine the roads where artificial intelligence will take the rule of all human drivers. Data drives our electric cars, and no accidents exist anymore. This sounds like a science fiction. Artificial intelligence will play a vital role in the development of autonomous vehicles. Through machine learning techniques, artificial intelligence will be able to make these cars move through traffic, make decisions, and perceive their surroundings. Artificial intelligence will monitor and analyze the traffic in real time, allowing for dynamic traffic management. This will reduce the traffic congestion and improve the overall traffic flow. Artificial intelligence will predict the traffic conditions, the usage of public services, and the demand for ride-sharing services. The data-driven insights will be very valuable in optimizing the routes, scheduling the services, and at the same time, allocating the charging resources. Artificial intelligence will support logistics. It will optimize the routes, predict the demand, and manage the inventory. This is very crucial for efficient transportation of goods. Artificial intelligence will also support the operators of the charging infrastructure. And this will contribute to the management of the charging infrastructure in terms of the energy cost as well as the maintenance. And this will contribute finally to the economic sustainability of the charging infrastructure. Artificial intelligence will also support electric utilities in the form that it will facilitate the integration of electric vehicles into the power networks, which will reduce the strain on the electric networks and balance the load. And this is very important, especially during the power peak loads. Artificial intelligence will also improve the end user experience 
And this is actually by providing him with information about the available charging infrastructure, um, the waiting time, and how to navigate to the nearest charging infrastructure. Artificial intelligence will revolutionize the transportation sector by considering the optimal planning of this sector. By leveraging data and algorithms, the transportation is gonna be made easier, safe, sustainable, and efficient. In the Smart Operation Research Lab at Khalifa University, we have covered multiple projects focusing on how AI will revolutionize this transportation sector. We looked at the planning of the transportation sector from two scopes. One of them is the long-term planning of the transportation sector, and the other one is the short-term operational planning of the transportation sector. When we talk about the long-term planning, we're looking at two things. One of them is the location and sizing of charging infrastructure, and the other one is the predicting of the energy demand for this charging infrastructure. We looked at the predicting of the energy demand of this charging infrastructure, and we looked at the weather impact. So the weather, like the, con the weather conditions, like the temperature, the humidity, and the wind speed, will impact the energy demand of these charging infrastructures. In hot weather, the electric batteries will degrade very quickly, which will necessitate more charging. In the winter, the battery will need to be heated up first before being charged, which is gonna add more demand onto the power network. Now, artificial intelligence is actually, is gonna help also in identifying the demand in terms of the energy from these transportation electric vehicles. And at the same time, schedule the charging sessions. In the second project, we looked at the optimal allocation of the charging infrastructure and sizing them. We took into consideration the projection of the electric vehicle demand and adoption growth rate, the driving behavior, and the traffic conditions. And we're targeting finding the best locations and sizes for this charging infrastructure. Then we move to the short-term planning of the autonomous transportation. And in that case, we considered multiple projects as well. Now, autonomous cars are actually self-driving cars. And then when they operate in the streets, sometimes we have human-driven cars, such as, for example, emergency vehicles like police cars. And what we need to make sure is that both types of cars operate well in this droughts, such that the human-driven vehicles, which are emergency vehicles, would reach their destination more quickly whenever they are needed. So, so what we did, we did an emergency vehicle aware lane change model that used the power of AI to plan how these emergency vehicles, which are human-driven, would reach their destination fast by Taking the benefits of autonomous vehicles, given that they're gonna give the priority of access to these emergency vehicles to reach their destinations. In the second project, we looked at the other side. What if this emergency vehicle is actually autonomous? For example, in the case of fire, or if we need an ambulance, every second counts. So we need to make sure that these emergency vehicles can cope with the other cars on the streets. So we have used the power of AI to plan these emergency vehicles which are autonomous such that they can reach to this, their destination by finding the optimal path and as well as controlling the traffic and at the same time navigating through the traffic without causing a problem to other road users. Now what makes it challenging for autonomous vehicles is the adverse weather conditions. Because if it's raining, for example, the, weather, the roads will get wet. And in that case, we need to make sure that there are no accidents taking place. So we benefited with the power of AI to take the weather impact in our planning problem, and we made sure that no accidents will take place when we program our autonomous vehicles. And this has been really achieved in the Smart Operation Lab. Now I'm going to focus on one showcase where we considered actually the Dubai. 
Dubai is divided into 14 districts, and we want to investigate how AI is powerful in the planning the charging infrastructure. Now, to plan the charging infrastructure, we consider two types of charging. One of them is the electric charging infrastructure, and the other one is the dynamic wireless charging infrastructure. But the question that may come up, why we should consider dynamic wireless charging? The idea here is that if we want to go fully autonomous, that means we want also the charging to be autonomous. And this is why dynamic wireless charging is really important. We considered two case studies. In the first case study, we looked at optimally allocating and sizing the dynamic wireless charging infrastructure and the charging stations infrastructure as well without the using the power of AI, but focusing only on the optimization. And then we have developed a novel AI model, which is a hybridized model taken of the benefits of multiple AI algorithms. And we did the same problem again. And we have found that we were able to minimize the government infrastructure um, cost by 2.2%. So this was an overview of the research that we have done at Khalifa University at the Smart Operation Research Lab. Thank you. Thank you, Amina. Very insightful, uh, showing both the potential of artificial intelligence to give insights, but also to automate. So um, and I think the, this is quite comprehensive. It shows that we can tackle a complex problem. Uh, you show uh, infrastructure. Yesterday, we had a workshop on food, an immense amount of waste that could be addressed applying the same thing. Uh, one caveat just for the discussion is that it works well in machine-to-machine -machine interactions where you can really apply. Unfortunately, when you put human being in the equation, there are some uh, randomness that makes uh, AI more difficult to apply. So uh, that's notably the case with the autonomous vehicle, but of everything that was shown. So a huge potential, thank you. So all of this is about exploitation of data, and of course, this data needs to be protected, to be, so what do we do in cybersecurity? Uh, thank you, Patrick, and thank you, Thierry, for this opportunity. We live in very interesting times. Uh, the security aspect has become a bit compounded with many conflicts. And in the allotted time, I will speak about seven distinct things. One will be the premise, second will be the threat, the third, uh, the strategy as we see it for Will mentioned about quantum technology, but not quantum computing, which is what Francois would be speaking. AI and cyber, some examples in the future. The premise, let me lay down the premise. First, we may all agree that there are no air gaps in cybersecurity, be it perimeter, cloud, space, or edge. Number two, the surface area of cyber vulnerability has expounded many folds with the adoption of IOTs and sensors. This is particularly true because we are uh, living in the world where most of our uh, critical infrastructures are connected. Three, encryption is everywhere, and securing our encryptions is the key to our di digital future or success. Today, we are more an encryption economy. The, an example would be to look at digital signatures. Uh, everything that we validate are based on digital signatures. And if there is a vulnerability on digital signatures, then we can imagine how our future might be compromised. Now, let me talk briefly about the threats. Global trends in cryptography are heavily compromised. Powerful algorithms like the Shows and the Growers uh, are using equally powerful computers that can crack down any encryption standard. They do that with quantum simulators, which are very powerful computers that can compromise encryptions. Quantum computers, uh, that is something it's like, you know, we all know when there was the, uh, uh, the advent of Y2K, there was a date, but nobody knows when quantum computers will come in. It's, it's knowing the unknown. Third, the majority of encrypted web data relies on an encryption standard called RSA 2048. A quantum computer with 4099 qubits will break it in a few minutes. 
This we don't see going beyond 20, 28. If not, it has already happened. Systems using today's cryptography for long-term author authentication is at risk. Just look at your health data. If that is compromised, well, that's why many of these hospitals are being hacked uh, because their data has very long tail. And cryptography built on mathematical algorithms are vulnerable to brute force attack. Finally, the grid will become the first in the line of attack when nations conflict or there are other econ compelling economic narratives. This includes national defense systems, critical infrastructures, which most of us, most of what we have today, banks, financial institutions, healthcare, army, navy, they're all critical infrastructures. The strategy. Let me put out two or three of these broad strategies which are being employed now. The first one is hack now, weaponize now. So if you have the algorithm, you have the cryptography to break these encryptions, you weaponize it now, or you hack now and store it, store it, and weaponize it later when you have the ability to break the encryption. So basically what we are try now trying is to move from mathematics to quantum physics, which according to pure science is it's much, much more difficult to crack. And this rests on two principles. One is the Heisen Heisenberg's principle of uncertainty, which enables uh, the identification of eavesdropping, actually the, the pipe falls as soon as somebody comes into the chain. The second is the no cloning theorem, it prohibits copying of data from quantum states. These are two, and the third, there is a third one which is the Bell's e inequality principle which prevents implanting attacks on, phys on physical systems. Now let me speak about quantum technology. I'm not going into quantum computing, See, the, this arises of the second quantum revolution. Incidentally, the first quantum revolution was much of the touted technologies that we have, nuclear, semiconductor, and laser. The second is more characterized now by manipulation, individ manipulating individual quantum systems. For example, eavesdropping using quantum key distribution, quantum computing breaking the RSA code. I will now allude to AI and cyber. AI systems will be vulnerable to adversarial attacks from any domain where AI augments action, which means the moment you use AI, there is a vulnerability. It's like a boomerang, it can come back to you. Now, these attacks will involve evasion, data poisoning, manipulation, thereby rendering AI much ineffective. For example, let me give you a conflict scenario. The, let's say the field use is in AI is supercharged Intel, which is ISR. The AI use case in this case will be object detection, which is asset, person, and weapon. And the AI attack in this case would be extraction and evasion. So if you look at what the Russians were able to do with their military fields uh, in this current attack, you will see a lot of this exploitation happening where they were able to mask most of their uh, places where they had kept their uh, aircrafts. Now, examples I, I would give of AI uh, in a, in a, in a, uh, is the combination of AI and being used with HAPS. The, you know, using satellites uh, would be a little more challenging, but you have a, a HAPS which operate at a much uh, lower altitude, and these become aerial data centers. So tomorrow when you are moving into autonomous areas of conflict, you would be using more of HAPS, and HAPS would act as area da aerial data centers, which will ensure quick communication to people who are on the field. And the second is, it's not a fiction, it's human enhanced uh, enhancement technology, which is cybernetically enhanced uh, human beings, which means that the human being you know, has implants in his body, and he's able to connect to a HAPS, and he's able to you know, take decisions much faster than, than having to call to a command center. Now finally, I would look at the future, which is the AI-based neural systems. So you have AI, you have quantum, but the challenge of AI 
uh, uh, or, or the success of con building quantum encryption is based on how much complexity you can build. With AI, you are able to increase this complexity uh, uh, using a technology which we call ciphertext. Currently, the highest standard that NIST has agreed is about two raised to the power of 256. But with AI-based uh, neural systems, you can increase this complex clump complexity of the cyber bit text to about two raised to the power of 2.6 million. So that's how uh, the future of uh, 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 the complexity of AI encryptions will be. There are pluses, there are minuses, but this is how uh, we <coughs> see the, the technology evolving. Uh, there are, you know, I have emphasized more on the military uh, part of it because the earlier adapters of all these advanced technologies we believe are uh, defense forces, and it is only after the defense and the military use it would become much more applicable in the civil world. Thank you. Thank you, Toby. Um, <clears throat> good to point have... connecting with what, <clears throat> sorry, Kazuto mentioned about the need for distinctive policies. I would take two points here. Uh, is a, when it comes to AI and cybersecurity, you describe the complex system and it increases the attack surface, what we call the attack surface. The more complex your system is, it increases. Notably, what you've seen from Amina and what to be explained means uh, a lot of identities will be created. All these machines will be identity. And you know, in cybersecurity, one of the biggest point is manage the identity, not, uh, and then the access based on the identity to the systems. So that's, that's a big complexity. And also, you use AI for the attack, uh, which is done. Uh, there is a kind of try to neutralize. Unfortunately, the parallelism is not yet in place. So uh, we have a few challenging times uh, ahead of us. So thank you, Toby, for this overview. Uh, Francois, it will get even faster. I need to stand up a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you uh, for Thierry and SN for inviting us uh, to this great conference. So Patrick gave me a challenge. He asked me to do in seven minutes <laughs> what I did in Stanford last week in 40 minutes. So <laughs> one of the uh, main things of quantum is speed. So I will try to be uh, as fast as I can. So we've talked a lot about AI. AI is three pillars. As a matter of fact, I hate this word artificial intelligence. Remember, Bergson says the machine is the arm of the workers. I'm usually talking about augmented intelligence, shared intelligence, like Waze, but I don't like this artificial intelligence. So artificial intelligence, augmented intelligence, is three pillars. The hardware, you have then um, the transmission, and uh, the software. Why do we talk so much about AI since you know, three, four, five years? There is three reasons. The first one is technology has increased the power the speed by incredible numbers. And for the first time in the industry, the three pillars has uh, grown very fast. The second, we all experience ChatGPT in uh, December. And ChatGPT, now everybody talks about that. And you have letters or speech done by ChatGPT. Mine is not done by ChatGPT, by the way. The last one is AI. Nobody understands it. It's complicated. And it's a very good tool for journalists uh, because nobody understands it, or the media, or the clickers. It can be fear, you know, you have the Cold War. So it has been a material used by the media at length to scare us. So uh, don't worry, it's not scary. I've, you know, um, as you said, uh, artificial intelligence starts uh, really in 1936, in fact. Then Turing team starts in 1953, and the first outcome when in 1956, I've been involved in AI since 1982, so I've seen the evolution and uh, the, uh, um, the use explosion of the power. So today, I'm going to talk about quantum. So quantum, I would say, is the third revolution. You know what is a revolution and evolution? iPhone 1 was a revolution. iPhone 15 is an evolution. You know, there is no, not a lot of things. So the first story of quantum, you know this famous uh, picture? You had Planck, Schrodinger, Einstein, 
at the Solvay uh, um, headquarters. The first meeting talk about what quantums, and then you have all the quantum physics, electrons, atoms, uh, photons, and stuff like that. 1950s, 1970s, introduction of transition, transistors, lasers, and other technology. Since 2020, a lot of labs uh, are start to look at what is quantum, can it be applied, and how quantum and AI are going to transform the world. So, uh, quantum is easy to, to understand. There were three revolutions. The first was analog computers. Analog is uh, from zero to 100. Then we move to zero one, bits and bytes. And now it's time to come back to a much more natural model, which is photons, which is electrons, and also uh, atoms. The nature hates binary. You know, in some country, uh, you have Swiss and cheddar. In some other country, you have 365 cheese. We are moving to the 365 cheese uh, technology because uh, as a human, we are much more inclined to do analog, which is a very smooth transition from zero to one, than in the brutal zero to one. So quantum is going to use a lot of natural things where photons will talk to photons, atom to atoms, and there is a huge amount of energy available on this transformation. So what drives the uh, quantum timeline? We, we, my colleague uh, Toby talked about post-quantum crypt cryptography. Um, there will be a huge revolution for quantum. I'll give you just an example about cybersecurity. I, used to, uh, I won the contract for the Olympic Games in London in 2012, we had 700,000 attacks per day. I talked to the Minister of the Olympics two weeks ago, and there was a forecast of 5 million attacks per day. It's huge. It will be robots all over the world. Uh, imagine if you are a hacker, you're famous because you ask a ransomware, but also if at the final of the 100 meters everything stops, you're a hero. So it's time now to, to move to another uh, steps, another uh, technology uh, leapfrog, which is a quantum. And post-quantum cryptography is a future of cryptography where you crypt, you transport, and you decrypt. And when the transport, it's impossible to attack. So at least we'll have soon a quantum-safe environment. So what is very interesting is quantum is power, is size, is energy, very low energy, and it's also sensing. Um, as an example, many of you have this, uh, this uh, smartwatch which analyzes your heartbeat. The sensing, uh, the quantum sensing will be able to analyze the magnetic field of your heart. So it's one million more accurate than anything else. So the power of uh, quantum computing, quantum technology, and AI will absolutely transform the world. There is plenty of replication. Uh, I was talking about uh, sensing. Um, when you look at medicine as an example, when you're sick, it's already too late. Because the weak signals you get, you're tired, it hurts a little bit, uh, and then you go to doctor, and the doctor asks you questions, symptoms, pathology, and then have small talks. The quantum sensing will be at some point embedded in your body, for those who want, of course, the body is obliged, will allow to do real-time analysis of your entire metabolism, look into uh, the web through AI to the pathology. So when you go to the doctor, as an example, the 30 minutes slot you will have with, with him will be five minutes uh, pathology and 25 minutes talking about small, the, the, the kids, the holidays, whatever. It's the intelligence, emotional, uh, emotional intelligence, sorry, of the doctor will be at its best. Um, another uh, uh, explanation or application is drug discovery. We went through the COVID, and during the COVID, we were very late. You know, it's about 10 to 15 years to, uh, to uh, develop a drug, the quantum simulation system will allow 
to develop drugs in two to four years. So it's not one day, it's not one month, but that it will be a huge revolution so that you can, uh, depending on new illness, you will be able to develop new drugs. Same for materials, uh, for aerospace or for luxury brand. Now there is lots of vegan rich people who want to have a Hermes uh, Kelly bag, uh, not with leather. So it will help also some brand to manufacture new uh, materials in a very short period of time. So in a summary, a there is a lot of a different things. I have a f f small film for you and then I will be done. Solutions. Here, we leverage the groundbreaking power of AI and quantum. For life science applications, we're using algorithms to calculate the quantum mechanical interactions between drugs and their targets. This improves the odds for success when entering clinical trials, which affects how quickly and cheaply life-saving drugs can be successfully brought to market. Today, computer-assisted drug discovery is either too slow to use on large numbers of molecules or too inaccurate to trust. But our unique AQ tools use artificial intelligence as a coach, achieving high accuracy without compromising speed. So, in a summary, the future is now, and be ready for this huge revolution after 35 years of evolution. Thank you very much. Thank you, Francois. <laughs> so, uh, before Thierry interrupts me, so I will open the floor for questions. <laughs> but uh, uh, just a quick summary. So, what we've seen, uh, tried to show you today, is that what? there is a breakthrough with so-called generative AI or supporting large language model that was explained. That's what put it on, on uh, draw the attention and put it on the top of the agenda because there is a, a new future. It's already deployed to manage complex system and it can help solve some of our most pressing challenges. Another challenge that comes is cybersecurity. And if you like AI the way it is today, you will love it tomorrow with quantum. So uh, if I may summarize <laughs> the session like this, thank you. So we have a, a, a lot yeah. of questions. Uh, maybe I take uh, the first, yes. yes. Can you give the mic, Madame yes. um, Touré? Thank you very much. My question is, how would you use this to end poverty and to solve development issues? Thank you. Yep. Two out of the question. Uh, yeah, um, here. Thank you. I, I had one qu uh, a question and, and a kind of an assertion. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah now, yeah. yes. Okay. Um, listening to uh, Director Andler and uh, Mr. Suzuki, I got the impression, maybe wrong, maybe right, that the impending dawn of AGI is going to be far more disruptive and dangerous than anything else that you've seen before. There is real fear that it could alter the fabric of nation states and tear apart uh, the, all the communities that we've seen across the globe. The point I'm, uh, I'm questioning is, would this mean that social and economic inequalities will rise exponentially? Social anarchy will rule the streets, as is already beginning to be seen in some areas. Will it flood the country with fake content masquerading as truth? And will we see a brutal breakdown of trust as we have known all these years? Thank you. Very good point. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Kerry. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I'd like to, to address uh, the notion, first of all, it's uh, any artificial intelligence outcomes are based on the content that goes in, the quality of the data. And specifically in the healthcare application, right now most of the clinical research is done on men um, and less on women. For example, can you address a little bit the notion of how we can correct for some of the data problems or the, the, the quality of the data content in order to achieve better outcomes? Yeah. 
I, I take the questions and then we will divide and uh, conquer. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we talked a lot uh, about regulation. Thank you, um, Mr. Suzuki. What about ethics? What is the what is the current state of reflection on ethics uh, applied to AI, quantum physics, etc.? Uh, it seems that we're quite far away, and this has not been tackled uh, so far. I, I couldn't hear the. I couldn't hear. You. Oh, sorry. So I'm I'm going to speak louder. Sorry. Um, we talked about regulation, um, but what about ethics? Ethics. What is the state of reflection on ethics applied to AI and and quantum physics, quantum uh, yeah. uh, computing? Hi, I'm an engineer from India. Um, now, there is a set of dangers inherent to AI. Some of them we discussed today. Uh, the other set of problems comes from the users or deployers of AI. I'm thinking rogue nations, I'm thinking other bad actors. Now, um, and to me, that incentivizes speeding up r resolving global geopolitical and other conflicts. My question is, the regulatory framework being developed uh, the world over. Um, does that include policies aimed at making people aware of the dangers of AI? And the reason I ask this is that to the extent that civil society at large has a say in policy making, um, maybe we get some positive outcomes there. Instead of, sorry to say this, but uh, talking in eco chambers or you know, keeping the public not so aware of uh, the risks. Thanks. You, last one, and then we, we answer. Behind you. Yeah. Thierry, go ahead. Well, uh, I am a Korean a diplomat. Uh, I worked as ambassador, but, so I'm totally ignorant about uh, this issue, but it was uh, uh, quite fascinating to uh, learn about uh, something about uh, AI plus quantum. I am uh, 75 years old. Uh, my target is uh, to live up to 100 years uh, because my mother turned 100 uh, still in good health. <laughs> uh, how much uh, AI plus quantum technology will, uh, you know, uh, well, uh, I, uh, what age, I mean, you could uh, say I could live up to uh, over 100 years. <laughs> okay. L last one, and then we start to answer, and then it might provoke other questions. Training large language models and new models require a huge number of computational resources. Yeah. How can we really combine these new advances of AI with our carbon footprints and decarbonizing goal in the next years. Okay. Good. Uh, if, if I look, uh, um, I, I will ask my colleagues uh, and I can volunteer for some of it. Uh, so we, we can, let's start with uh, maybe the first one on, on the disruption on society, how you address, we address the development problem. Uh, that was the first question. I don't know if uh, one colleague will take it or I give it uh, a start and then you can build upon it. Uh, I, I think we, we heard it in, uh, yesterday in, in uh, the session on, on food. Uh, we need public policy. Technology is always a mean to an end. So if the end is not defined, if you don't have the governance, technology will not, uh, uh, will not fill the gap. Uh, I remember 20 years ago, I was uh, with uh, the International Telecommunication Union in Geneva, and we were, if you remember, all already discussing, François has been working on it, on uh, the, uh, the digital gap, uh, the divide that was creating. Uh, we could overcome part of it, but it requires the right framework. So now you've seen in the presentation of Amina that uh, you can manage 
complex problem. You can eliminate corruption through automation. You can manage better the resource allocation with technology, but it requires uh, 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 the proper governance and the framework. I was on a workshop in another institution for reconstruction of Ukraine, and here, clearly, if you want to address corruption, for instance, you, you, you will use uh, satellite images because you can know if uh, 10 tons of concrete have been deployed at that place and even the quality of the concrete depending on what you have and then you deploy blockchain so you use token because this is an immutable ledger and then you you know exactly what comes in what comes out so the tools are here now is 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 again is the governance the the will uh, to to do it and and deploy it uh, technology alone no but all what we try to show you are means that can help achieve this objective. You can allow me here to add something to it and give you an example. One of the challenges for the developing countries, for example, in some countries, that they're suffering from electricity theft. And we know that electricity is very important for our lives. Nobody can live without electricity. Now, through AI, we can also predict thefts because only with the people, like for example, in some countries, like for example, India, they have developed programs where they, where they assigned volunteers from the villages to see if there is any electricity theft. But this is very hard. But with the power of AI, we can automatically detect if there is an electricity theft going in, in, in place, and where is that location. So in that case, with the power of AI, we can improve electricity access, and we minimize any issues relevant to the power interruption. And then we move to the next one. But the, and then there was the question, of course, awareness, education. That that's fundamental. You need to. We need to understand, otherwise uh, you, you cannot think that a few people will know what's best and uh, it won't happen. People will need to appropriate what happened in the gap that I uh, mentioned before with the ITU is that when mobile was deployed and people start to understand what can I do and then I can improve uh, my farmer's market because I, I know how to handle it. We, education is fundamental. There, the, the, that was your question. Uh, the the, the there was a point on uh, ethics. Daniel, what's your take? Um, Where are we? <clears throat> well, I, um, there's, of course, a huge uh, interest in AI ethics or <coughs> AI for good and all that. As you may know, some of you may know, there are about over 100 uh, charts and ethical codes put out by all sorts of organizations. And, um, and a number of principles. Um, roughly five, six, seven, ten principles about transparency, respect of privacy, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, very close, in fact, to the general uh, principles of uh, um, clinical medical ethics. In fact, the, 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 the initial model for thinking about AI ethics is medical ethics. And um, what I just want to say in a short, very short time, because there's, we're running out of time, is that I think that these general principles of AI ethics, just like the general principles of bio, clinical ethics, are not enormously helpful. Uh, first of all, they, they are conflicting. You can have, uh, say, privacy and also access to all the data that you really need to improve, uh, say, uh, medical research. And there, there are many sorts of problems, but the main point is that these general, overall, overarching principles are not really about ethics and are not really interesting. Things get interesting once you do exactly as my neighbor said, to divide things up. In other words, if you use AI in education, that's one thing, and it raises a whole set of really interesting and hard and important problems uh, in ethics in education, similar for ethics in defense, similar for ethics in surveillance, etc. So you have to uh, divide up the uh, CAI is really a, a general tool, which 
interesting, sort of uninteresting general principles governing its use. And then things get interesting once you go into medicine, defense, education, and so on. Thank you. Uh, so we, we have to conclude soon. So um, maybe I propose Kazuto to be Francois, you, you take the question that you've heard as your concluding word, and then we can close the session. Kazuto. OK, um, thank you very much. I, I think some of the questions uh, touches upon the demand side of the AI. And I think um, most of the regulations are now focusing on the supply side. So the ethics, you know, how to apply ethics in the, the way in which that how to, how to um, design AI, how to use AI. So it's basically the, the engineers and, um, and the suppliers are now being regulated. Uh, but because of the such uh, a wide use of AI, and as Daniel said, it's, it's really complicated because there's no single principles can apply for the different use of AI. And I think uh, that for the demand side, it is so popular and you know, so easy to use. So ChatGPT and the other uh, softwares are now available for everyone to use AI uh, for, for generating the fake news or fake, fake video or anything. So I, I think this combination of the, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the, the spread of the software and the network, you know, the social network uh, uh, which, which delivers those products from the demand side is now making it much harder to regulate, but I think the, one of the discussion I made was because since there are, it is difficult to have the sort of a single one fits one size fits all regulations. We need to see the demand side and make sure that you know these demand side should be regulated in order to have the proper supply of the AI. Yeah. Uh, there was two questions on health. When you take your car, you go in a plane or take a train, you ne will never take your car if there is no petrol or you have a flat tire. When you look at what's going on on health, the only signal you have is you wake up in the morning, you don't feel good, but it's too late. The combination of quantum and AI will allow you to have some sensors in the body, for those who want, of course, that will allow you to have real-time evolution of, as an example, of a cancer by magnetic, magnetic resonance. Those data will be aggregated, will go into the cloud, into the cloud that will analyze all the pathology and will give you a proactive signal on what's going on. If you do one blood test per year, you will have real-time blood tests. If you do uh, uh, a lot of tests on your body once every other year, it will be real time. Same for, um, as an example, last example that will uh, speak to everybody. After 50, there is not a lot in this room, by the, by the way, you don't wait on the same 50 50 on, on your legs. It's more 60 40, 65 45. There is technology now that allows you to figure out how you wait is balance between your feet, 4,000 sensors per feet. So if you do what we call linear inter interpolation of the balance of the weight through the sensors, it will go through artificial intelligence and tell you that in two months, five years or whatever, you will have a scoliosis or whatever. So the main benefits of quantum AI and technology will do proactive maintenance of the body exactly as we do with a car, the train, or uh, the planes. So, I, I, I will just, yeah. Yeah, yeah, 10 seconds. Just to answer the question about how does it impact uh, society and protect. Just take the case of the next virus, the next pandemic. It's a, it's a game changer, it's a showstopper. Whichever part of the world we live, as you saw it in, in the coronavirus now. The ability for research institutes, science institutes to produce a counter drug or a vaccine will be much faster when we are able to use it. And I think healthcare will be one of the uh, HCFs that we can start in terms of uh, building this as a narrative. 
the upsides could be plenty, and as uh, Patrick said in the beginning, it will be the challenge for us to discover what is the ups upside for every society. For example, when mobile technology was adopted, you know, people said the big digital divide as the ITU conference was there then, but you saw Africa adopted it, and you saw amazing success stories in Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda. They created a large number of entrepreneurs. So I think it's best, you know it's good, how good it is, I think we'll have to take a few steps to see uh, how it will work. I think that's, uh, you know. So, uh, Amina, as the youngest, can you close? <laughs> yeah, um, thanks for the very informative sessions and for the interactions with the audience. Uh, and I hope that the session was very helpful. And thank you for attending. <laughs> thank you.